Good afternoon, everyone. Sir Owen Disney here, and we're going to talk a little Monday Night Raw, because obviously I worked last night, so I didn't get a chance to do the video last night like I normally do. So I'm bringing this video to you guys right now. But before we get started, obviously we're going to go into a little housekeeping like we do here. First off, number one, it is November 12th. Do you know what that is? Well, November 12th is the day of the first video that was ever filmed for Pop. Way back when it was Welcome to My World, I guess is the unofficial title of the channel before that. The first video was filmed inside Alan's vehicle on the way to Columbus to the Nationwide Arena for Monday Night Raw. And it's appropriate that I'm talking about Raw today. Filmed with this right here, this iPod Touch, fourth generation, with my awesome Mickey Mouse cover that I got at Toys R Us for, like, dirt cheap. So, yeah, that was the first video ever filmed for this channel. We filmed a couple videos that day. We filmed that video. We filmed inside the arena, just for a second. And uh, we also got to film outside the arena, and that was the second video that was posted. Now, truth be told... November 20th is the official anniversary of the first video that was ever actually posted on this channel. So, November 20th, we're going to talk about that. But since it's November 12th, it's technically the one-year anniversary of the first video that was ever shot for this channel. I thought it would be a great time to talk about that. So, that was really awesome. So, if you guys want to see the beginnings of pop before it was pop, you can go check out the playlist down here on this channel, and there's a playlist called My Daily Thoughts About Life in General. I don't know why I use such an elongated title for it, but basically it's just like random videos talking about my day and everything like that. It doesn't really have a theme going to them. The first video you see is a video called Driving to Columbus. It's about a minute and 15 seconds. And it has the uh, first time I ever posted the NSFW, which I said a long time ago was something I would do on a regular basis. Instead of that, I just put in the description bar some colorful language and included, so you have been warned. So, because of that, you can check out the first video we ever posted. The Not Safe for Work is the very end of the video. Uh, will flip me off. So yeah, there's always that. So yeah, the Driving to Columbus was the first video posted. Then we were outside in the... Uh, cold weather outside the Nationwide Arena, waiting for Alan to come back from getting tickets for something for a friend, and I was just filming Will randomly, just like Will texting his life away, and that's how this started. And very soon, we will get into our one-year anniversary for Pop. The one-year anniversary for Pop is May 1st, so we're looking forward to that as well. Very excited about May 1st. And next year, we're going to talk about the first video ever posted on Pop. And uh, that's going to be awesome. So, I wanted to throw that out there real quick before we get started uh, talking about Raw for last night. And uh, I just want to throw that out as a little tidbit to everyone. So, yeah, if you check back on the uh, Pop playlist, you see the first video, May 1st. I was basically talking about... Pop is coming. This was posted on April 17th. April 17th, I said Pop was coming, and then I some more info on the 25th, and then uh, March 1st, we actually put out our first video, again on our way to WWE Monday Night Raw in Columbus. How appropriate. So yeah, that's how it works, I guess. So yeah, I do want to talk about another thing as well before we get started with the recap. Which I was very happy that Raw last night had uh, nothing about what's best for business. Just a little Randy Orton stuff at the beginning. And, and it was com completely gone. And then I didn't worry about it the rest of the night. So yeah. I don't care about Big Show and Randy Orton. And I've said this numerous times. So yeah. This was all about a lot of other awesome things as well. So I do want to show you something that I just got today. Now I know we were searching for these and everything. And this is what I finally ended up with. These are my brand new shoes. Look how awesome these look. Look how cool these are. These are New Balance Men's ML574 Windbreaker Fashion Sneakers. So yeah, this is like the inside here. 
Looks really comfortable. They are really comfortable. I actually worn them already, and uh, they're not all messed up like normally. And look at these awesome shoelaces. So cool. These things might as well glow in the dark. I mean, I don't believe they do, but they look like they could. Look how cool the uh, shoelaces are. I love them. They yeah, props to my mom for taking care of the shoes. Now, excuse me. AJ's finally back. And again, I just like I apologized on the videos that I'm about to talk about. Sorry about things not be able to get Versus and AJ's movie review for Thor The Dark World out when we'd like them to. But they're done. And tomorrow will be the long-awaited uh, review of Thor The Dark World, which we watched yesterday. And Thursday will be the brand new Versus. The cryptic comment is still Ghost. And you're asking yourself... Oh, and does that mean we get two verses this week? And I'm like, yeah, you do get two verses this week because verses will return this coming Sunday with the cryptic comment of sickness. And that's going to take us into next Sunday, which is the same day as Survivor Series, which I'll be watching on Monday, and uh, the final WDW Today live podcast before Reunion 2013. That verses will be Scott. And that will be our final scary-themed verses to take us into... 2014, that'll be another time you'll get another Scary Themed Versus. That'll be the final Scary Themed Versus. We went two months with Scary Themed Versus, and uh, our big finale is going to be Scott. So you can wrap your head around that and try to figure out what Scott is. I'm sure if you think about it hard enough, you'll probably get it pretty quickly, pretty easily. So, since I did work last night, and thanks to Molly, I got McDonald's, and that was over with me. I was not able to watch Raw until just about 20 minutes ago, and I basically, I didn't necessarily procrastinate, I kind of got up, I had breakfast, and I just kind of like chilled around for a bit, and now I'm here, it's almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm talking about Raw, and once this video gets uploaded, it's going to be multiple hours, this will be late in the night when you get this video, and I'm sorry about that, I guess it's just... Because of the way things are going now, with I'm not able to upload directly from the iPhone anymore because it clips everything, it's going to make it really hard. So what I'm going to have to do is film this video. And once this video is over, I'd say about an hour if I had to guess, uh, just sit here, watch it, could happen. So after the video is over, I'm going to upload it to my desktop and then take the desktop and upload it directly to uh, YouTube from there. And that takes like four hours, five hours to do that. So yeah, this video will be up, but it won't be up till later, so a lot of things that I'm talking about right now have already happened, so yeah, AJ will be by uh, later today, and uh, or will have already been by by the time this video gets posted, to uh, write some more on the script, and uh, Wednesday, of course, I have to work, yeah, that wonderful two-day shift. Thursday, we're going to be uh, doing Best Man Holiday, so that's pretty much taken care of. A lot of question marks on what we're going to be getting this week. Uh, we're going to get the uh, wider release of 12 Years a Slave. Or are we going to get Nebraska actually on time? Or are we going to get Blue is the Warmest Color or All is Lost on uh, Athena's uh, end of things? Either way, this is going to be an interesting time. So, there's always that. So, excuse me. Now, eight minutes in, let's get to why the reason you guys are here right now. And that is my... Raw recap. So we're going to talk about it. And it was live to tape Manchester, England. And basically, I knew these results like hours before they aired because the spoilers were released. And I was like, I don't want to read spoilers, but I'm like, I'm at work, so I can't watch this till tomorrow anyway. So I might as well. So I read the spoilers and I was thinking, I was like, wow, no Triple H, no Stephanie, not much Randy Orton except for the first segment. I'm liking this. I'm liking this a lot. A lot of uh, emphasis on things that I actually care about. So that's cool. And, um, we'll see what this goes from here. And I was like, all right, I'll give this a shot. So, uh, Randy Orton comes out, yay. And he says, pretty much, without uh, beating around the bush, he's going to win at Survivor Series. And he says, because Triple H and Stephanie are on vacation, that he's in charge tonight. Well, this prompts Brad Maddox to come out to a nice pop from the crowd, mind you. And he says, with all due respect, Randy, I am the general manager of Raw, so that means that in the absence of Triple H and Stephanie, I'd be in charge. So, basically, I'm going to make this match tonight, and here comes Glenn Jacobs out to the ring. So, yeah, if you're going to like do something and like put him in a suit and everything, don't call him Kane. Call him something else, please. 
Even Mr. Kane, which Brad Maddox called him, is better than anything. So, yeah. Kane comes out. He says, I'm the director of operations. Yeah, Triple H gave him that in one of the segments I refused to recap on the channel last week. So, that means I am in charge tonight. So, Maddox says, you know what? Just follow my lead. So, we're going to start off the show with Randy Orton facing off against Cody Rhodes. And Kane's like, no, that's not going to happen. We're going to do... Randy Orton against Goldust. And Orton's like, you know, who am I going to face tonight? I mean, it's not like I ha I could face them both if you really want me to. Of course, this brings Vicky up. She comes out since she is the general manager of SmackDown, which has absolutely no, uh, no weight on the Raw show. She basically proposes the idea that Randy Orton gets what he wants. He faces the WWE Tag Team Champions in a handicap match. And that match is next. Again, after this first segment, Randy Orton's pretty much taken out of the show. Well, there's like segments like sprinkled throughout the night, but basically this was very awesome because, like I said, not any what's best for business garbage I'm tired of dealing with. <coughs> Excuse me. Is the change in weather. Oh, by the way, it's snowing, or it was snowing, or it might still be snowing by the time that you see this video. So, yeah, it's like super cold outside and it's snowing. So, there you go. So, opening contest on Raw, Randy Orton taking on the WWE Tag Team Champions, uh, Goldust and Cody Rhodes. Uh, this match is actually pretty decent, as usual. So, Randy Orton, shock surprise, locks on a chin lock. And Goldust elbows his way out. Whip in reverse. He goes for the Samoa Joe snap power slam, and he gets stopped. Goldust rolls him up, one, two, and Orton kicks out. Goldust plants him with a DDT and tagging to Cody Rhodes. He nails a springboard missile drop kick. Whip in reverse into the tip up into the sunset flip by Cody. One, two, Orton kicks out. Boot to the midsection, drop down, uppercut. Cody's got Randy on the ropes right now. He goes up top, standing moonsault, connects. One, two, and the WWE champion kicks out. So he ducks the clothesline, goes for the 3.0 backbreaker. It gets tossed off into a high knee lift from Cody off the ropes, tag into gold dust, and he gets whipped into Orton. Orton scoots out of the way, he nails the buckle. He goes for the RKO, and he gets tossed off in a right hand from Goldust, and they double clothesline Orton over the top rope to the floor. Orton just says, forget it, takes the count out loss. Here comes the big show. Oh, goody gumdrops. He pounds away on Randy Orton over and over again. He sends him shoulder first into the ring steps, and then the short arm clothesline. And in a really unique move, he sets the ring steps up against the announce table. And you know something bad's about to happen because they start ripping monitors out. And you know that table is going to be reduced to dust by the next couple seconds. And that's exactly what happens. So he goozles Randy Orton and he climbs the top of the steps. And Big Show's seven foot tall. Orton is up in the air and for the choke slam. And he choke slams him through the table from an elevation of at least ten feet up in the air. And the fans pop for it because they don't care who it is as long as they see someone kick Randy Orton's behind. So they lay him out. He's left laying inside the remnants of the table, which is now laying on the ground. And that's the end of the segment. So Randy Orton, um, like I said, he'll be sporadically uh, sprinkled throughout the night. But decent match for what it was. Handicap matches were the... Um, were the deal tonight, actually. There were three of them in the show, so and they were all decent for what they were. This one, um, if I had to put a, a pin on it, I hate to say it, it's probably the worst. And that's not bad. It's not saying anything bad about the match. If I had to put them against the Real Americans against John Cena and the Wyatt family, well, long day, the Shield against uh, Dana Ryan and CM Punk, then uh, I would have to say this is the least of the three matches. That doesn't mean it's bad. It means compared to the other two, it's not as good. So there's always that. Big Show lays out Randy Orton, puts him through a table. Yay. So that's good. Maybe we won't see the Big Show the rest of the night. Actually, we don't see the Big Show the rest of the night because when we come back from commercial break, he gets inside a cab and gets transferred to wherever he can get a pint. Yay. So there you go. Thankfully, Big Show does not return. <laughs> So we get our first match of the evening, and yay, another thing that Owen doesn't like, Los Matadores. And the crowd's not really into them either, and they're, face they're teaming up with Santina Morella, who apparently is wearing bull horns now, so he can uh, 
match well with Los Matadores and El Torito, and they're facing off against a team that's called the Union Jacks. They come out to brand new music that I like, by the way. I'm sure Wade Barrett wouldn't like it, because Wade Barrett doesn't like any music that's anything around him. And Union Jacks are basically three-man band dressed from head to toe in uh, the British flag, i.e. the Union Jacks. Makes total sense, right? So this is a six-man tag team match. Los Matadores, which, like I said, still are I'm not sold on. I like Primo and Epico. I really do. I like how they work in the ring. I don't like this gimmick at all. I just wish they could have done something else with it. And like I said, just I don't like this. I like three-man band. I know I'm in the minority, except the crowd in Manchester seemed to be really into 3MB. Actually, they got a huge 3MB chant when they came out wearing the gear they did. So we get to the match. And Jinder Mahal hits a high knee lift, or Jinder Jack, as they called him on 4 uh, one Mania, on Diego. Tag in, Drew McIntyre plans with the big boot, so he knocks Fernando off the ring apron, and Diego with a backdrop suplex counter, tag in a Jinder, and tag into Santino, of course. Split-legged drop down, and then the beal off the ropes, and the falling headbutt, but he gets the knees up. So... Heath Slater chases El Torito into the ring, and Torito gores him to the floor. Drew with a double goozle, and he tosses Torito to the floor. This allows for a double tope by Los Matadores on Drew McIntyre. Torito stands on the top rope and nails a somersault senton on Heath Slater. This allows Santino to hit his one-armed ace crusher and lock, go ready for the Cobra. He reveals that the Cobra has bull horns. And Bull Cobra, one, two, three. Um, I like JBL's line about Bull Python, but the problem is Pythons don't strike, they strangle. So completely uh, does not work. But it sounded good in my head, and I'm sure it sounded good in JBL's head too. So yeah, um, it was okay. I don't want to see either one of these teams against each other anymore. And I don't want to see a three-man band against the Usos anymore. I want to see three-man band do something else. I don't care what it is at this point, just something else. Uh, still not sold on Los Matadores, and I probably won't be for a long time. Our next match of the evening, uh, the very angry uh, Damian Sandow taking on Kofi Kingston, and uh, right away he goes to work with the uh, four knee strikes. He tosses him to the floor, he tosses him back in, and a very unique maneuver, he drapes him over the ring apron, and he pulls the literal ring apron over the face of Kofi, and he stomps away numerous times, finally makes a very deep cover, one count only, so a chin lock, Kofi punches his way out, whip in reverse, and he gets whipped hard into the buckle, so five big shoulder blocks in the corner, Sandow's taken over at this point, three stiff headbutts knocks Kofi to the ground, leaping knee drop, one, two, and a kick out, so he locks in a front face lock, gets turned into a chin lock, and Kofi again punches his way out, and he gets caught with the Kobito Akiet and then a driving elbow at two separate occasions, one, two, and a kick out. Sandow goes for a leaping leg drop and Kofi uh, gets nailed with it, one, two, and a kick out. So front face lock applied this time. And, uh, mm, excuse me. So, leaping leg drop this time missed. Like I said, I was reading the wrong way. Sorry. I'm reading, as you guys should know this by now. Leg drop misses, charges, gets the boot up, and a double leg by Kofi. And he pounds away on Sandow. High heel kick, one, two, and a kick out. So, he goes to the middle turnbuckle and nails shadows over Ghana. One, two, and Sandow kicks away. Whip in, reverse, charges in, and he kicks him up. Springboard kick, you know, the flip kick he likes to do. And he gets caught with a You're Welcome out of nowhere, one, two, three. So, uh, big win for uh, Sandow. They're really pushing him. Um, really pushing him. And that's a good thing. After losing money in the bank to John Cena, losing his opportunity at the uh, World Championship by John Cena beating him. There we go. I um, A lot of people on the internet were saying, oh, Sandow's done. He's not going to go anywhere. No, Sandow's going to go somewhere. And I said on this channel, just like Mick Foley said out and about as well, that Sandow's going to be something somewhere very time, very time, wow, something somewhere very soon. That's the word I was looking for. Wow, my mouth got all like jumbled there. 
So uh, we get another matchup, this time for the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, Curtis Axel defending against Dolph Ziggler. <clears throat> Again, this match was good and very enjoyable. Um, Curtis Axel either needs to lose the championship now or they need to do something with him because he's kind of stagnant at this point. It's kind of like stagnant pond water at this point. So we go midway through the match like we do here on Pop. Whip in reverse. Axel sends him hard into the buckle, goes momentum carrying him over the top rope to the floor. So he gets out of the ring, picks him up, rams him back first into the ring apron, tosses him back in after pounding away on him numerous times, makes a cover one, two, Dolph kicks out. So four driving elbows, one, two, and Dolph again kicks out. So the Vader-style cross face, and he chokes him on the middle rope, and again, pounds away on the back of the head of Dolph Ziggler, of course. Not really called by the announcers, but in essence, playing up the fact that Dolph had that concussion, and Alberto Del Rio pounded away at the back of his head, and that's exactly what Curtis Axel did in this match. Uh, sometimes uh, commentators don't cover this. I would have, because I do, and I just did. So he shoves him off, and he nails him with that exclamation point spike DDT on Curtis Axel. He charges in, he goes shoulder first into the ring post, does the Intercontinental Champion, and duck the clothesline, and hooking clothesline off the ropes from the challenger. Ziggler nails the big Ziggler splash in the corner, and goes for a 10 punch, which gets turned into an extra shot, so it's an 11 punch. The reverse neck breaker, and the leaping elbow, 1-2, and kick out from the Intercontinental Champion. So he goes for the name dropper, and he ducks out of it, goes for a catapult into the buckle, and rolls Ziggler up with the tights, one, two, and Ziggler kicks out, gets up to his feet, nails the name dropper on Curtis Axel, one, two, and a kick out. So he goes for the whip, gets countered into the snap backdrop driver from Axel, one, two, and two and a half. So he goes up top. He climbs up, does Dolph, and face buster off the top, one, two, and again Axel kicks out. Some really good action at this point. So many times we've seen this happen, and so many times it's going to happen again. Ziggler goes for the zigzag, he gets swatted off by Axel, and Axel tosses him up in the air, elevator down, and plants him with the hatchet, one, two, three. Curtis Axel retains the Intercontinental Championship. Again, a really good match. Good to see these two against each other. They have decent chemistry in the ring. Uh, I like the opening sequence, too. It's good stuff like leapfrog, dropkick. I, I like it. I mean, it's it's very old school, but it's very good, and it, it works really well. The thing about this match is both men are kind of on like a... I can't say... A, I guess I can say a losing streak, to be totally honest. And they're both very uh, stagnant in the way that their characters are coming off on television right now. Dolph obviously needs to go somewhere sometime soon, and unfortunately, everybody's saying his mouth gets him into some trouble. I don't have a problem with that, but apparently uh, the higher-ups do. And Curtis Axel is really stale, and they need to do something with him. So, we'll see where that goes from there. So, Brad Maddox and Kane are pretty much arguing uh, who is in charge of Raw, and they're going to make two handicap matches... Maddox makes the Real Americans against John Cena, and Kane, not to be outdone, makes the Shield against Daniel Bryan and CM Punk. And they agree to shake hands. Well, Brad Maddox agrees to shake hands, and Kane's like, well, how about we don't? So we get our next match of the evening. Uh, Tamina Snuka taking on uh, Nikki Bella, of course, uh, the Divas champion, the gorgeous, cute, and crazy AJ Lee in uh, her corner, and uh, beautiful Brie Bella in uh, Nikki's corner, of course. So, ducks the clothesline, does Nikki, and goes for a monkey flip. Tamina tosses her off, and Tamina stomps away, makes a cover one count only. Scoop slam into a modified bow and arrow by Tamina Snuka. Very nice maneuver there on Nikki. And uh, basically bent her backwards over the middle rope. That sounds bad, and I'm sure it does. That's what she did. She pretty much just bent her in half. So she kicks her in the knee, does Nikki. High knee lift, and uh, Tamina plants her with the pump handle power slam. One, two, and a kick out. Chin lock, and then she locks her in a Canadian backbreaker. Nikki flips her way out using the assistance of the top turnbuckle. Low backdrop. It was really nice because she charges in, and usually the backdrop, you toss the opponent over your shoulder and over the back. Backdrop. Ah, so the name's not just ironic. So what she did this time is she kind of went low and went to her knees, and she actually kneed out on the backdrop, and it looked really nice. 
So, back elbow, satellite head scissors take over, and Tamina is in trouble. Clothesline, clothesline, comes off the ropes. Monkey flip this time gets uh, nailed, and a face buster, or a side face buster, one, two, and uh, Tamina kicks out. Charges in, she gets the boot up, and kicks her right in the knee. AJ, behind the referee's back, pretty much just drops her throat first across the middle rope, and a big boot on Nikki. AJ sends Bree to the apron, and this allows for Tamina to go up top. Superfly splash on Nikki. One, two, three. Bree gets in the ring, and AJ skips around the ring happily. She gets drop kicked. Tamina goes for a clothesline, gets drop kicked of her own, and that's the segment. So, still putting up the hype about uh, Total Divas just coming back from this past Sunday, and that's why we're getting stuff like this. Crowd didn't know who to cheer, cheer for in this match. They just want to cheer for AJ. Tamina has proven her worth as a bodyguard, and it works really well. Nikki's getting better in the ring. Not as good as Brie, but Nikki's getting better in the ring. So, yeah, this was interesting, and it still builds the feud with AJ and Tamina against the Bellas. And if you don't think we're still going to get Brie Bella against AJ Lee somewhere down the road, you're not really paying attention. Because, obviously, we're building towards it when you have Tamina against Nikki. I would say that they, I don't, I didn't read SmackDown spoilers at all, but I would say they would do a variant of Brie against AJ or Brie against Tamina or maybe do the tag match on SmackDown this week just to continue that. Unless they're uh, doing the house show that's the same night, but I don't know. So, uh, basically, I have this in one sentence, and I'm just going to recap it in one sentence. Randy Orton just simply wonders where the Shield were. He says ass a bunch of times. And basically, Ambrose says, don't worry about where we were. It's not any of your business. We don't work for Brad Maddox. We don't for, work for Kane. We don't work for Vicky Guerrero. And Roman Reigns pipes up and says, we sure as hell don't work for you. We don't work for anyone. So, interesting, interesting. The, the, the seeds are planted now. The shield does not work for anyone, or so they say. So, we continue this. And we get our next match. UK's favorite son, who is not from the United Kingdom, Fondango with the stunning Summer Ray, taking on Tyson Kidd with Brandy Music and Natty in his corner. Uh, this match is really good, too. A really good TV match between these two. Really good back and forth match. I'm pretty sure we've got ourselves a feud now. And that is a good thing because these matches are awesome. So. Spinning back kick from Tyson Kidd, and he nails Fondango to the side of the head with the front drop kick. Whip in reverse, tip up, and basically he gets caught by Fondango and tossed over the top rope to the floor. So Fondango goes in to grab him, toss him back in, one, two, and a kick out. So he goes on to chin lock. The chin lock's locked on. Tyson fights his way out with an elbow. Backdrop, suplex, floats over, lands on his feet, comes off the ropes, Charges into a snap Rana, sending Fondango face first into the middle turnbuckle. So he charges in, gets the boot up, and a springboard missile drop kick. Fondango goes to the floor to regroup, gets caught with a Rana off the ring apron to the floor. Looked awesome. Tosses him back in, and a uh, springboard into a sunset flip. Fondango drops down, knees across the shoulders, hooks the legs, and that's all she wrote. One, two, three. Fondango wins this one. Uh, the right person went over, and uh, considering the UK really wanted to cheer for him in this match, and they did the whole time, the whole night. They were fondongling the whole night, and it's true. And to appease the uh, the fans in the UK, Fondongo came out wearing uh, the Union Jack on his uh, gear. So that was really cool of him to do that, and he got a really good face reaction for this match. So yeah, good Good back and forth match between Fondango and Tyson Kidd. Always nice to see TJ back in the ring again. Um, very happy to see him back on television again. So yeah, this feud can definitely continue. These both can go, especially against each other. They have amazing chemistry. And I don't think we've seen the last of Summer Rae and Natalia either. I think that's going to continue as well. So we get our next match, and it is the match that was made by Brad Maddox. And it is going to be our first main event of the evening, the handicap match of the Real Americans, Antonio Cesaro and Jack Swagger with Seb Coulter at ringside, taking on uh, the current world heavyweight champion, uh, John Cena. So yeah, this match, uh, the first half of the match kind of lulled a little bit, but then it got kicked in a high, high gear. 
So let's talk about the match from the midpoint, shall we? So Cena goes for the half Nelson uh, reverse neckbreaker. One, two, Cesaro kicks out. So tagging a swagger. He nails the swagger bomb, and then he goes for it again, and he hits it a second time. And Swagger's like, I might as well hit it three times. So he goes up for the swagger bomb again. Cena rolls out of the way, tagging a Cesaro. Cesaro comes in, goes for a clothesline, and ducked by Cena, comes off the ropes. There's a shoulder block. And Swagger comes in, goes for a clothesline. He ducks it, and shoulder block. So he comes off the ropes, and he gets stopped with a stiff European uppercut from Antonio Cesaro. Goes for the giant swing. Gets countered into the STF momentarily. Kick off by Cesaro. Ducks the clothesline. And he gets nailed with a protobomb. So tagging a swagger. He goes for the Patriot lock. It gets countered. And he kicks it off. Tagging a Cesaro. He goes for a flying body press of all things. Countered into the AA. And swagger clips the knee. That diving clip to the knee off the ropes. And Cesaro's weight falls on the back of Cena's neck. So that was a nice move. Makes a cover one, two, and Cena kicks out. So he goes for the Gotch style neutralizer and backdrop by Cena counters it. Tagging a swagger, ducks the clothesline, and protobomb goes for the five knuckle shuffle. AA gets countered into a sunset flip into the Patriot lock, and he's got Cena on the ropes, and he front rolls out of it, goes for the AA on swagger, and it gets reversed. Tagging a Cesaro. Actually, no. I think it reversed and lands, and then Cesaro makes the save right before the three count. Jack Swagger tags out to Antonio Cesaro, ducks the clothesline, and power bomb from John Cena, one, two, and a kick out. Comes off the ropes, toss up, Swiss death, one, two, and Cena kicks out at three. So he does the charging uppercut in the corner, puts him on the buckle, and he climbs up. Cena punches his way off, tagging his swagger, runs up. Belly-to-belly -belly superplex gets countered, punched off by Cena, flying body press, and he clotheslines Cesaro over the top rope to the floor, drop toe hold on Swagger, locks in the STF, and he taps real quick, one, two, and that was the end of the match, so there you go. Finish of the match over, Cesaro jumps Cena from behind, starts giving him the vicious headbutts, comes off the ropes, and Cena clotheslines him over the top rope to the floor, Del Rio hits the ring with chair shots to John Cena, and he traps the arm of Cena in the chair, stomps away on the chair trying to break the arm again, and he locks the cross arm breaker on Cena, and the referee's trying to pull them off, but to no avail because they're referees and they can't. Biggie Langston hits the ring, pulls ADR off, and tosses him over the top rope to the floor. So since he interjected himself in the match, Del Rio wants some revenge, and he wants a match, so of course that match was made for later in the night. Our next match is Ryback against R-Truth. Uh, Truth got over in this match. Uh, Ryback came out, and um, yeah, this was interesting for what it was. So he ducks the clothesline, boot in, whip reversed. Ryback gets kicked in the chest when he drops down for the backdrop body drop. So he gets picked up and slammed hard back first into the corner, and Ryback picks up Truth again and rams him to the opposite corner. So a high-velocity whip, and he chokes him in the middle rope. Military press, into the over-shoulder power slam, and a big scoop slam. The big splash, one, two, Truth kicks out. So he locks on the reverse bear hug, turns it into an actual bear hug, and a headbutt from Truth. He punches his way out, comes off the ropes, gets caught with a spine buster from Ryback, and Ryback readies for the meat hook. Meat hook ducks and roll up by Truth, one, two, three, and R-Truth beats Ryback. Uh, interesting, really, really interesting. Especially if they're going to be building him to Goldberg at WrestleMania 30. I'm not sure if I understand why he lost tonight. So our next match, uh, Alberto Del Rio against Biggie Langston, and of course made uh, pretty much right after uh, Del Rio saw uh, Biggie get involved in his uh, beatdown of John Cena after the Real Americans John Cena match uh, a couple segments ago. So Langston with a shoulder off the ropes. He doesn't whip him in the corner. He tosses Del Rio into the corner. He charges in. He gets the boot to the top of the forehead. Makes a cover one, two, and a kick out. So the stiff kick stomps away. Makes a cover one count only. So a chin lock. Biggie elbows his way out. Whip in and goes for a DDT and counters at one, two. And leaping stomp from Del Rio. Chin lock and he elbows his way out. And he locks on a cross sleeper into a chin lock. Side slam by Biggie, counters it. Very nice move right there. So clothesline, clothesline, ducks the clothesline, and belly-to-belly -belly suplex from Biggie Langston. 
He nails the Ultimate Warrior style big splash, high elevation to the lower back of Del Rio. Charges in, misses. Del Rio nails him with a step up in Sagiri kick, one, two, and Biggie kicks out. Goes for the cross arm breaker, momentarily gets tossed off. Gut shot, Vader attack off the ropes, drops the straps, goes for the big ending, and Del Rio slithers his way out from under the grasp of Biggie Langston, locks on the cross arm breaker. He fights valiantly, but has to tap out. So, um, not as good as their match a couple weeks ago, but it was okay. A decent match for what it was. I could have seen a lot worse than this, and um, Del Rio obviously has to look strong because he's going after Cena in two weeks. And Langston has to look strong because he's now a full-fledged upper mid-card babyface going after whomever he needs to. So, yeah, he's on the middle of a push right now, so he has to look strong as well. So this does not hurt either man losing or winning these matches. We come back from commercial break, and Paul Heyman's in the ring. Uh, he is sitting in a wheelchair. He's got a neck brace on. He's got crutches. His arm, his, everything's body from head to toe. He's almost like he could be, like, mummified. Curtis Axel standing by his side with the Intercontinental Championship over his shoulder, like you do. So he pretty much just calls Ryback a big, ugly dummy who he gave an opportunity to. And he guaranteed the victory, and he likes to say, feed me more. Well, with CM Punk, he bit off a little bit more than even he could ever chew. He blamed the fans more than anything for pretty much getting Punk to beat him mercifully with the Singapore cane and even climb the cage in the first place. He says, I shall return with vengeance. I will hover above CM Punk like a sword of Damocles hanging over his head. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and I will drive it straight into his heart. Here comes CM Punk. Punk comes out. Axel meets him at the entranceway and they start brawling. And Axel ends up getting whipped hard in the barricade. Punk plants him with go to sleep and leaves him laying. He gets in the ring. He grabs Heyman's wheelchair, he spins it around and pushes him out of it. He grabs a Singapore cane that was from underneath the ring and he canes him 16 times over and over again with the Singapore cane into that segment and that also tells me that we are not done with CM Punk and uh, Paul Heyman even though he got his come up and some top of the hell in cell. So we'll see what that goes from there. Uh, Daniel Bryan's music hits and we get our main event and what a main event it was. Handicap action, three on two, The Shield, United States Champion Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, and Roman Reigns taking on the MVP of the WWE, Daniel Bryan, and CM Punk. This match was really, really good, about 15 minutes long. So we go to, not midway through, we're actually like to the beginning of this match. So Punk and Bryan double suplex Ambrose, Bryan makes a cover, one, two, and a kick out, whip in reverse. Back elbow, tagging to Seth Rollins. So Rollins comes in, whip in reverse, and nice knee lift from Brian off the ropes. There's the stiff kick, locks on the Latapatia on Rollins, tagging to Punk, and he nails a spinning back kick on Rollins, one, two, and a kick out. Kicks Punk, whip in, gets caught with a drop kick attempt, and turned around, catapult, go to sleep, counters, and tagging to Roman Reigns, who works Punk over. Whip in, goes... Shoulder, mm, excuse me, slides under the legs of, uh, read my writing here, slides under the legs, tagging to Dan O'Brien, and they double kick the hamstring over and over again, double whip in, and they go for a double clothesline, and Roman Reigns lays out both CM Punk and Dan O'Brien with a double clothesline of his own, further proving he's going to get a monster baby face push somewhere down the line. So they toss Punk to the floor. Brian's a legal man, so he focuses on him. Tagging to Seth Rollins. Whip in, backflip, duck the clothesline, come off with the hooking clothesline. Not this time. Ducks the clothesline, comes off, and a release German suplex from Daniel Bryan. Charging drop kick, puts him on the turnbuckle. Top rope, Hurricane Rana, and that's all she wrote. One, two, and no kick out. So the yes kicks, and he's sitting up for the buzzsaw. And he kicks Ambrose off the apron. This allows for Seth to hit a spinning Insigiri kick. Drops Brian. When we get back to live action, the chin lock is applied. Brian elbows his way out and elbows him over and over again, pretty much maneuvering him to the corner. Whip in reverse, and Brian goes upside down into the turnbuckle, makes a cover, one, two, and a kick out. Tagging to Ambrose, the U.S. champion comes in, nails the power drive elbow, one, two, and a kick out. 
So he bends the fingers back of Brian, steps on the hand, and tagging a Roman Reigns with a headbutt, and two stiff elbows to the neck from the seated position on Brian, and he comes off the ropes, and a right hand to the chest, one, two, and a kick out. So tagging to Seth Rollins, Rollins with a stomp, scoop slam, one, two, and a kick out. So he locks on a modified Cobra Clutch, or a modified Shin and Amaki, depending on uh, who's calling your match. So Brian elbows his way out, Tagging a Roman Reigns. Roman comes in, double whip, and this ends up backdropping Rollins over the top rope to the floor. He low bridges Roman Reigns. He goes over the top to the floor, and Brian has to make the tag right now. So they get in and tag in a Dean Ambrose, and hot tag to CM Punk comes in, springboard, crowns him with a double axe handle, and the side axe handle. And again, and he axe handles Roman Reigns off the ring apron, and he nails the spinning neck breaker, the running knee in the corner, and the short arm clothesline goes up top for the Macho Man Randy Savage elbow, and Seth Rollins makes a save before the three count. Getting into high gear here, folks. So a missile drop kick from Dan O'Brien onto Seth Rollins, and Tope sends him hard into the barricade. This allows him to be distracted long enough for Roman Reigns to run over Brian with the Superman clothesline. Punk nails the tope on Roman Reigns and springboard clothesline, ducks out of it, ducks the clothesline, high kick, go to sleep, and he pulls him off. Roman Reigns picked up, go to sleep on him, and Ambrose rolls him up, hooks the tights, one, two, and a kick out, goes for a sleeper hold, gets flipped off, Punk locks in the Anacon device, and we get a wide interruption. We're about to get the whites in the shield for the first time. <laughs> So when the lights come back on, Eric Rowan and Luke Harper are in the ring. So Rollins is about ready to attack, and they shove him aside. So this just starts World War IV right here and now. And basically, Rollins and Harper are having a jawing battle, which is hilarious because I'm, they're having an Age of the Fall war of, war of Words because obviously they both used to be members of the Ring of Honor stable, the Age of the Fall, with uh, Jimmy Jacobs. So we have an Age of the Fall shouting match, and Ambrose gets involved, and Rowan gets involved, and then immediately they just start fighting. And they are brawling like crazy in the center of the ring, and Manchester fans are going insane. And on the floor you have Bray Wyatt and Roman Reigns, and they start going at it, and they start brawling, and everybody gets in the ring, and Bray's trying to separate, and Ambrose is trying to separate, and they pretty much just come to the common ground that Bray says, we have a common enemy, points over to Punk and Brian. So, cooler heads prevail, and all six men charge towards Punk and Brian. They slide into the ring, so they're in the ring with their backs against each other, getting ready to fight off the world of the Wyatts and the Shield. So, what happens at this point? They all get into the ring, and they mug Punk and Brian. And, with out of nowhere, with the quickness... The Usos and Goldust and Cody Rhodes hit the ring. They eventually drive the heels from the ring, and they stand tall. That's how we go home for Raw. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Great way to end the show. Match was awesome, by the way. And I love this very, very slow burn between the Wyatt family and the Shield. It is official that they're going to go at it eventually. But... They're not going to do it quite yet. And they're not going to do it at Survivor Series either, because there was a rumor that there was going to be this match at Survivor Series. They were going to do the 12-man tag. But no. Right before I started filming today, I can tell you with complete certainty, the match was made on uh, my WWE app, actually. I got a message on mobile that said that it was official, that it's going to be Eric Rowan and Luke Harper against Daniel Bryan and CM Punk at Survivor Series. So that match is going to happen. So, yeah, that adds to our Survivor Series card that we ha we know already with John Cena and Alberto Del Rio for the World Heavyweight Championship and Randy Orton defending the WWE title against the Big Show. So, yeah, that adds to it, and I'm sure we're going to get some sort of a multi-divas Survivor Series style match. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of interesting things to come out of the next several tapings for WWE. Obviously, we don't have any sort of Survivor Series card right now. So we're going to build to that and build to that. So yeah, this was a great way to end the show. Uh, I really enjoyed the show for what it was. Uh, the Randy Orton stuff, whatevs. 
But uh, like I said, the show from top to bottom, um, it wasn't bad. Orton against the Rhodes Warriors, uh, it was okay for what it was. It was decent. Um, I could have done without the six man. Sandow showing like ruthless aggression on uh, Kofi Kingston. Uh, Dolph and Curtis Axel were a really good Intercontinental title match. Very enjoyable there. Uh, Truth beat Ryback. Very odd. And then Paul Heyman turned on him. Del Rio and Biggie Langston. An okay match. Not as good as they had a couple weeks ago. But still, I mean, it'll prevail. It'll go further. Fondango and Tyson Kidd had a great back and forth match that really played up the fact that UK loves him. The Real Americans and John Cena. The first half of the match, not the greatest, but really kicked it in a high gear for the second half. And the main event was awesome. So yeah, Raw was a mixed bag this week, but it helped considerably due to the fact that there was not any what's best for business garbage this week. Uh, a little bit with, obviously, Kane and the stuff with Brad Maddox and Vicky Guerrero and even Randy Orton. So no Triple H definitely this week. So that was actually good. And uh, good because uh, we're getting kind of burned out on it, to be totally honest. Um, I really want this this what's best for business angle to end soon, really soon. I know Vince is supposed to come back till at least January, but God, end this, please. I want something. Can we move on to something else, please? It's like when the Royal Rumble, when the big show defended the world title against the big boss man. Uh, I didn't want to see that, and I don't want to see this. So yeah, there you go. So done with this. Big show Randy Orton, just have Orton beat him and then just go, go somewhere else. You want to do Big Show and Triple H? Fine, I don't really care. Just keep it away from the, the championship and get the, get the title off Orton and uh, let someone else uh, take it from him somewhere down the road. I like the title on Orton right now because you have to have a heel have the championship. I still want to see Brian and getting the big WrestleMania moment winning the championship at WrestleMania, but who knows if that will happen at this point, so yeah. But yeah, interesting episode of Raw. I really enjoyed the interaction between the Shield and the Wyatt family. Uh, I know a lot of people said they had a perfect opportunity to turn the Shield face tonight. Why didn't you turn the Wyatt family face tonight? And after tonight, I pretty much realized something 100%. Now, obviously, Bray Wyatt, when he laid out Daniel Bryan, we laid out CM Punk, the comment was, the devil made me do it. Well, think about it from this perspective. Maybe the devil is not what's best for business. Maybe the devil's Paul Heyman and the Wyatt family are the new Paul Heyman guys. That would be what's best for business. In the meantime, if you like these videos, tell your friends about them. Leave a comment. Do subscribe and help spread the word about Pop. We are 2,600 views away from that magical 20,000 view mark. And we are at 152 and counting on subscribers. Got to get more subscribers day by day to find out more about the Popcaster Revolution. Three ways to contact me. Uh, you're more than welcome to email me if you want to send me your thoughts, comments, queries, and opinions to surrowanddisney at gmail.com. If you want to tweet me, I accept requests on Twitter. I will probably follow you back, most likely. Uh, it's uh, at Surrow and Disney. And if you want to become my friend on Facebook, you're more than welcome to do that. It's Owen Disney. So in the meantime, thank you guys and girls out there for watching. And uh, wrestling fans, I will join you guys again on this coming week where we're going to talk Impact and we're going to talk NXT and SmackDown. So we're on the road to Survivor Series. And until tomorrow, boys and girls, that's all I got to say about that.